Good evening. Welcome on a rainy night. A perfect place to be inside to hear about uh, some wonderful things that concern trees. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I'm not a member of the uh, regular introductory scheme here in terms of the Harvard Museum of Natural History. My name is Ned Friedman. I'm the Arnold Professor of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology, and I'm also the director of the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University. And it's a great pleasure to be here this evening to uh, introduce uh, this evening's speaker, uh, Peter Del Tradici. Now, before we get to Peter, I just want you to know that this is part of a series of uh, talks that are being organized and sponsored by the HMNH uh, that are centered around their most wonderful new exhibit here in the uh, museum galleries, and that's the exhibit on the New England forests that was made possible by the Zoffness family. Uh, if you have not been to see this exhibit, I would encourage you uh, to make your way uh, into the galleries to uh, learn more about the ecology and the uh, history of New England forests. And of course, all of these talks are really an amplification of that theme uh, that are designed to take us beyond the exhibit and continue the dialogue that we're having about the history of New England forests, as well as some aspects of their future. Anyway, um, tonight it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Peter Del Tradici. Uh, Peter received his bachelor's degree uh, in California from the University of California in Berkeley, uh, actually in zoology. Uh, and despite that inauspicious start, he's ended up rather well, uh, I'm pleased to say. He went on to get a master's degree uh, at the University of Oregon and then a PhD in biology from Boston University where he did his dissertation work on ginkgo biloba. Uh, I think he and I share the distinction of being the only two people in the last 50 years to have done a dissertation on ginkgo biloba. <laughs> so we've been fast friends from the very beginning. Uh, Peter has been, uh, since uh, 1984, or since 1979, a member of the Arnold Arboretum staff, and he is a senior scientist uh, who has been central to so many aspects of what the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University stands for the basic science that lies behind trees, and importantly, the communication of that science to the general public. In fact, I can think of no one who has done more for the Arnold Arboretum to, to share the science that lies behind uh, university walls than Peter Del Tradici. Uh, he's won a number of awards for his work uh, uh, over the years. He is currently also an adjunct associate professor in the Department of Landscape Architect Architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And he continues to challenge our thinking about all kinds of aspects of plants. He continues to collect plants in China, for example, and to write about plants. His most recent book is The Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast, a field guide uh, published by Cornell University Press. He studies almost every aspect of botanical diversity that I can think of. But this evening, he's going to focus on the trees and the forests of New England. Uh, please welcome Peter Del Tradici speaking on the emergent forests of New England. Well, thank you, Ned, for that introduction. That was a little too long, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless. Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here tonight. And, you know, I, I want to personally thank all of you for braving this abominable weather uh, that descended on us today. And so um, I hope I don't disappoint you. Now, some of you uh, may have been here last month when David Foster spoke. He opened this series of lectures about New England Forest. And he talked about the deep uh, ecological history uh, of the New England forest going back to uh, the ice ages uh, when, when New England was under, uh, you know, many thousands of feet of glaciers 12,000 years ago. He looked at the early history of New England forest and he looked uh, at the, uh, the, the past history of hurricanes and uh, the legacy of the early settlement of the New England forest and then their abandonment in the middle 1800s. So what I thought I would do tonight, rather than uh, go over that again, is sort of pick up the story of the New England forests where uh, David Foster left off. And as you can tell from my title, it's really the, the 
the critical or the central metaphor that I'm going to be using tonight is really the, the metaphor of disturbance. And understanding the role that disturbance plays in shaping our forests. And then uh, what I'm going to do, and it's probably against my better judgment, I'm going to try to actually speculate a little bit about what the forests of New England are going to look like in the future based on uh, my observations, my years of living in New England, and sort of my reading of the scientific literature on this very complicated subject. So without further ado, I think I can just jump right in. Um, some of you uh, may remember June 1st, 2011, when a uh, tornado struck uh, central Massachusetts and did a tremendous amount of damage uh, in the Springfield area. It was dramatic and this picture uh, I downloaded from the Boston Globe and we, you know these disturbances they're, they're not something that you know happened in the past. They're ongoing and uh, they strike randomly. They're a stochastic events technical term for that. And these are something that, you know, are part of, uh, in a sense, the, nor the natural disturbance regime. And forests, uh, they're, they're leveled by these processes, but they do come back. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's very common here in New England are, are ice and uh, snowstorms that uh, hit us every winter, and depending on where you are on that line between <laughs> freezing rain and snow, uh, you can just get hammered by one of these ice storms. Um, you know, I vow that I will never ever plant another white pine as long as I live, uh, having lost so many of them over the past five years uh, because we're by house is located, uh, we take a lot of damage. Um, as David uh, mentioned, I'll try to keep this up here, uh, the stone walls that are so characteristic of New England are a legacy of the agricultural uh, heritage of New England that, uh, what's funny about these stone walls, and a lot of people don't realize this, when the land was first cleared, it wasn't as though there were a lot of rocks on the surface that had to be picked up. There were not a lot of stones on the surface, but what had to happen first was the trees had to be cut, uh, the stumps had to be pulled out, the land was plowed, and it wasn't till uh, really the late 1700s and the early 1800s that the stones began to emerge as a product of the deforestation and the erosion that's associated with the uh, first 100, 150 years of agriculture. And it, was a, it actually became a religious issue because a lot of these stones were interpreted as the stones coming up out of the soil as a sign from God uh, that somehow uh, the New England farmers had done something wrong. So the stone walls were mostly built in the late 1700s through uh, the 1820s as a desperation to get uh, so the farmers could actually plow their land. And of course, so those are a legacy really of early deforestation and erosion associated with uh, agriculture. Now, we have no idea what this agriculture looks like. You, you know, there are drawings, there, uh, you can go to look at the Harvard Forest models, but there are some places in the world, I took this picture in Ecuador, in South America, and it gives you some idea of what agriculture in its heyday actually looked in look like in New England, and you see virtually all of the trees are gone. Uh, you have the, the walls separating the fields, and you get some, uh, you get, begin to get an idea of the level of disturbance that was involved in clearing the land for agricultural purposes. Uh, and this is a really important aspect that is often overlooked when you talk about agriculture, that one of the critical elements of agriculture is the plowing of the land. And what the plowing inevitably does is typically soils are a layered structure. They have an organic layer, a mineral layer, and plowing essentially homogenizes that. And because farmers keep plowing at the same depth, eventually over time a hard pan develops uh, below this uh, plow layer, as it's known. And so the soil characteristics on land that has been plowed for a number of years is radically different from that of the soils that you find in an undisturbed site. And certain plants are adapted to 
these different soil types. So there's some plants in the New England forest that are only found on soils that have been plowed during their history, and there are other plants that will only be found in soils that have never been plowed. A good example of that is our native Canadian hemlock. You typically only find Canadian hemlock on land that has never been plowed. It, it can have been a woodlot for many, many years, but as long as that native soil profile is intact, that tree will flourish. But you typically do not find hemlock on soils that have been plowed at some point in their life. Now, agriculture is not the only legacy of uh, the past uh, cultures that uh, were dominant, or the past economies, I should say, in New England. I like this slide. It's from a recent publication uh, from, uh, I believe it's from uh, Science Magazine. And you can see here on this that the red, this is an, in a map of the number of dams uh, in the Northeast. And red indicates an inc the, inc the high density of dams, and then going down, uh, the blue is the lower density. You can see here in New England uh, the incredible density of dams on small streams. So these are not ri big rivers, these are small streams. And this is southeastern Pennsylvania. So these are three counties in southeastern Pennsylvania. And you look at the number of small dams. These are all date back to the early to mid 1800s. So you can see you know, the extent to which the land was disturbed not only for agricultural purposes, but a lot of these dams were associated with industry. So not only was the land disturbed, but the uh, entire drainage pattern of the land was also uh, rigorously uh, disturbed uh, in the 1800s. Um, and of course, the other thing that people tend to forget is that right through uh, pretty much 1900s, horses in urban areas were the main engines of work. They did all the work. We really uh, do not remember that at all. We just sort of think of them as sort of quaint relics of the past. But how do you feed the thousands of horses that were necessary to do the work was an incredible problem. And hay is a low value crop. And so, you know, Cultivating it at a great distance away and bringing it into the cities made no sense at all. So a huge percentage of the land immediately adjacent cities was used to grow hay to feed the horses that did the work. And a lot of the plants that uh, we find not only in cities today, but also in all the surrounding countryside, particularly the grasses, are all legacies of this era when hay was the major crop uh, to provide the fuel for the horses. And of course, I love this. Um, there was one of the very first uh, urban planning conferences ever held <laughs> anywhere in the world in New York City. And the big issue that they were dealing with was the buildup of manure. And there's actually statements that said by 1950, the most major cities in the world were going to be buried up to nine feet deep in horse manure. So, you know, this gives you some idea of, you know, the relationship between the land and the cities. And we have just sort of forgotten all of this stuff, but the, the plants live on as a legacy of these past, uh, you know, uh, these past economies. And, you know, this, is, this takes us up pretty much to about 1900. Now, What's remarkable, and David, Far David Foster referred to this, is these forests, despite everything we've done to them, have made an incredible comeback. We have great forests here. They're absolutely terrific. It's one of the success stories of uh, conservation, that somehow, despite everything, uh, New England is you know, forested up to 80%. And it's just it's remarkable. The thing that's really interesting, though, is that the forests, as they exist today, are very a different kind of forest. They're not the same kind of forest that existed when uh, the early settlers. And these charts are great. They show the difference between the colonial distribution and the modern distribution of a number of tree species. And they established a colonial distribution uh, by going to the old town records. And if you, when the land was first broken up, they wrote down the name of each uh, species of tree that defined the corners of those properties. And if you go to every town, in every New England state, and you write down what tree marked the boundaries of those properties, 
And if you analyze it, you have a random sample of the distribution of trees at the time when uh, these states were essentially breaking up the property and opening it up. And you can see that uh, beech trees from the colonial period have dropped considerably in Massachusetts. Birch has increased. Actually, mostly this is Betulolenta, the sweet birch. Hemlock, this is a little out of date. Hemlock has actually gone down because of a new pest, the adelgid. Maple, huge increase in maple. And this is mostly red maple that's gone, left the swamps and sort of moved into the uplands. Um, oak. Is, seems to be in decline. Nobody, this is, people are still trying to sort of figure out what's going on with oak. Hickory is more or less the same. Chestnut is gone, and pine is showing a large increase, mostly pitch pine here uh, in the Cape and white pine here in central Massachusetts. So the forests have come back, but it's a different kind of forest. And not only is it the forests that are different, but the animals that live in the forest also. Uh, you know, show a different relationship to that forest. I love this uh, image. It again comes from the Harvard Forest, but you can see the green line represents the trajectory of forests over time. Uh, you can see that the birds that like open land, they reached their peak in the mid 1800s. They're now actually our most endangered species. Uh, the deer, this uh, purple line here, you know, there are more deer in uh, Massachusetts now than have been since the glaciers receded. Uh, it's rem remarkable. And you see down here, you know, Henry Thoreau, who spent his entire life in Concord, Massachusetts, he never saw a deer in Concord, Massachusetts. He once talked to somebody who saw a deer in Concord, Massachusetts, <laughs> if you can believe that. Uh, you know, wolf, they were extirpated, you know, in the late 1700s. Beaver was reintroduced, uh, you know, make a huge comeback. Coyote, of course, uh, you know, is not part of the original uh, native fauna of New England. It made its way here on its own, coming through Canada and then coming down from the north. So, you know, by a strict definition, we'd have to consider the coyote an invasive species. Um, I don't have to tell you about deer. Deer are having a profound impact on the landscape because they're very selective in what they eat. They eat some plants, they don't eat others. This is a picture of a deer exclosure that. Uh, I was involved in setting up in Redding, Connecticut, and I'm standing at the edge of the exclosure. Uh, it's an eight foot high fence, polypropylene fence, and I'm looking out, and you can see here, this is, this is what the understory, and that forest, there's the browse line of the deer, and then I turn around, and I'm looking inside the exclosure where the deer can't get, and you can see the difference. So the, the, when deer population numbers reach a certain level, they're just having a dramatic impact on the vegetation processes. And uh, sad but true, they seem to like our native species much better than uh, our non-native species. So they are dramatically altering the composition of our modern forests. And of course, uh, beaver, I, I showed the picture of the beaver. If you, uh, you know, have any familiarity with beaver, um, you know that they're like a midnight logging crew when they come in. Uh, they just take everything uh, and leave devastation in its wake. Um, what, what's interesting about beaver is that they were eliminated from Massachusetts by 1700. They were reintroduced um, in the western part of the state uh, in the 1920s and again a little bit later in the 30s, and they have now taken over the full state. They're well inside the Route 95 line, and I believe, although I haven't seen any documentation, they're, they've been recorded. They're certainly in Middlesex County, but I'm, I'm pretty sure they're in Essex County as well. And they find the, uh, you know, the Boston suburbs fine to their liking. So again, this is something that, you know, we haven't seen beaver in this part of the world for well over uh, 200 years. Uh, not only is it the vertebrates that are, uh, are different, but there is this issue of a variety of forest pests that have uh, been introduced uh, intentionally and, and inadvertently that have also completely altered the composition of our forest. I just love this picture. Uh, manually cleaning the gypsy moth egg cases off this tree in Malden. Can you imagine that? How did these guys get up in that tree? I just, it's incredible. 
Oh, the gypsy moth was uh, inadvertently introduced into Medford here. This is the range of the gypsy moth in 1889, the blue line 1890, and the red line is 1891. So this was, this, there were agricultural pests that were, were a problem before that, but this is the first forest pest that really uh, had to be confronted. And uh, it was just at the time when entomology was taking off as an academic discipline and there was a Bureau of Ento uh, Economic Entomology associated with uh, a national organization and UMass Amherst was involved in this and they decided that they were going to eradicate this pest. That was, this was gonna, this was gonna be an example of how, econ how economic entomology could save the world. And they, uh, the Massachusetts legislature allocated hundreds of thousands of dollars for this project and they tried for almost 10 years to control the gypsy moth, keep it within this red, this red line. Uh, and it just, you know, it's not for lack of effort that they essentially failed. And what people don't realize in the 1890s, there was no such thing as aerial spraying. Aerial spraying was invented in Massachusetts specifically to fight the gypsy moth. So we were a leader in technology even back in the 1890s. And of course, um, <clears throat> this is a sad part of the story, but we also developed in Massachusetts lead arsenate uh, to combat the gypsy moth because they, there weren't a lot of synthetic chemicals available and huge quantities of lead arsenate were sprayed by men who were just wearing their street clothes. I mean, it's a tragic story when you look at the, the, the tons of material that was spread on the landscape to control it with no idea of what the health impacts were and certainly no idea of the fact that once this material is in the, the ground, it's there forever. So again, these are the kinds of legacies of land use that we, we're not, you know, we sort of have forgotten about, but they are there. And you know, once something happens to the land, it, that, that it impacts what it can become in the future. And of course, the other thing we forget about is in 1944, following the, uh, as World War II was winding down, the companies that manufactured DDT were looking for new markets for their products. And so all of a sudden, uh, lead arsenate, which was developing a bad reputation, was dropped like a hot potato and replaced with DDT. And DDT became the weapon of choice for fighting the gypsy moth through the 1960s. And uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, is, uh, has a lot about DDT in it. And that DDT that she refers to was being sprayed specifically uh, to try and control the gypsy moth. Um, other pests and diseases you're familiar with, I'm sure, the American chestnut, the, the king of the uh, northeast forest. This is the last chestnut. This is in the town of Harvard, Massachusetts. When I first moved to New England in 1970, you used to see quite a few of these big old snags standing in the forest. But this is the last one I'm aware of. It's about a meter in diameter. But the chestnut still exists uh, as a sprouting uh, seedling really, uh, it, it, the stems are killed by the blight, but there's an underground structure here called a lignotuber and that is not killed and so it still sends up shoots. And what's interesting is most of the chestnuts that we see in the forest were actually seedlings in the 1920s and 30s when the blight came through and they've been sprouting like this for well over 80 years. So these are giant seedlings. You dig them up and have a massive underground structure underneath there. So effectively, uh, the fungus has reduced, you know, what's a, which was once a, a noble tree, and it's now a shrub. And so, you know, in another, oh, you know, 10,000 years, maybe uh, <laughs> some evolutionary uh, stasis will happen and the chestnut will begin uh, reproducing again, but at an earlier age. So it's, it's interesting to sort of look at these dynamics between uh, native uh, tree species and their introduced pests. The Dutch elm disease, uh, again, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, in the 1930s, 1920s and 30s, roughly 50% of all of the street trees in the Northeast were American elms. Uh, when the uh, Dutch elm disease struck in the 1930s, uh, it just completely altered uh, the landscape, the urban landscape. Uh, it's essentially wiped out all of the uh, trees. And this is, you know, a, a picture, it's an old postcard from 
Colchester, Connecticut. But you can see here, this was the uh, typical planting from these small towns uh, throughout New England, all American elm. And so when the gypsy, I mean, when the Dutch elm disease arrived, it just moved right down the line from tree to tree. So the damage was devastating. What's interesting, though, is that American elm is still a, uh, a very common tree in our native wetlands in particular. It reproduces uh, its seeds at a very young age. You find seedlings coming up everywhere. They live for about 20 years. They get up to be about a foot or so in diameter, maybe a little less than that. And then at the point where they reach a sexual maturity, their growth starts to slow down, and that's when they become susceptible to uh, they're having their vessels clogged by the fungus, and then they die. So again, the Dutch elm disease fungus, it hasn't eliminated the American elm, but it's changed the age structure of the population. So instead of living to be 100 years old and being a massive tree, uh, American elm is now a young tree that lives for maybe 20 or 30 years and then succumbs to the disease. So it hasn't wiped it out, but it's changed uh, the way the, uh, the role that the elm plays in our native forests. And most recently, if you read the newspapers, um, uh, another pest, the Asian longhorn beetle, uh, was recently discovered uh, two years ago, three years ago now, actually, in Worcester, Massachusetts. And so far, in an effort to eradicate this pest, they've cut down 30,000 trees. If you haven't been to Worcester uh, lately, it's, you should go. There's some neighborhoods where every single street tree is gone. And the big issue now is that the bug has entered the native forest uh, surrounding Worcester, in particular the watershed around Wachusett Reservoir. And so uh, how they're going to actually deal with this is, a, is an ongoing issue. So the infestation uh, is, is not controlled yet, and so this is an ongoing issue. But you know, the point here is that the, all of these issues, none of them are going away. They're all ongoing. And you know, this is something that, uh, in effect, is, is really becoming the norm. And this is, uh, again, not to be too depressing, but <laughs> nevertheless, this is the emerald ash borer, which was uh, introduced, again, from Asia here in Detroit. And now this is from 2010. You can see it's in western Pennsylvania, migrating across the state. It's in uh, western New York. It's now, uh, this year, in central New York. And somebody even told me it was on the banks of the Hudson River on the west bank of the Hudson River. I haven't crossed the Hudson River yet. So, and this is, this is unlike the uh, Asian longhorn beetle, which is sort of a slow-moving pest, takes a long time to reproduce, and is, you know, quote, unquote, relatively easy to control. This emerald ash borer is very difficult to control, and uh, it kills, there's about four species of ash that are native in this area, and it attacks all of them. And we already know that uh, a huge percentage of the ashes in this area are dead, and there's really very, very little that can be done about it. You see those purple things hanging from the trees if you uh, hang out in, in this part of the world, and they're just trying to monitor, you know, has the ash borer arrived yet? I know in uh, northwest Connecticut, where uh, my family has a house, those, they're, they're expecting the emerald ash borer to arrive within two or three years. So. That's something to look forward to. Uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid, this is a, 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 a pest that I've done a lot of research with. Uh, this arrived uh, from Japan. It's a pest that was introduced from southern Japan uh, inadvertently on contaminated nursery stock. And it was first recorded in uh, Norfolk, Virginia in 1950s. And it made its way uh, up the coast mid-Atlantic region and then into New England. It arrived at the Arnold Arboretum in uh, 1998. And this is a graph of uh, the brown is the area uh, that's part of the natural range of the hemlock that's now occupied by the hemlock woolly adelgid. And you can see the green is the uninfested parts of the range of the hemlock and the yellow uh, represents areas that are recently infested. You can see here southern New Hampshire, uh, and southern Vermont. The um, interesting thing about this, though, is there seems to be a line here around southern uh, New Hampshire and southern Vermont that a lot of insect pests don't actually cross, that it seems to be 
too cold for them. And I think that this uh, adelgid is definitely in that category. If you look at this graph here, this is the minimum winter temperature at the Arnold Arboretum from 1963 to 2010. And if you divide that in two, you can see that up till 1984, the average winter temperature was around minus five degrees. But from 1985 to 2010, it's much closer to zero. The reason this is important is that at minus five degrees, you get 98% mortality of the woolly adelgid. The cold keeps it in check. Uh, but if it doesn't get that cold, the bug proliferates uh, readily. And you can see here that since uh, roughly whatever this is, 1992, we've only had one winter when it got below minus five degrees. So to a certain extent, the spread of the adelgid is really have been facilitated by climate change impact. So, you know, a lot of times it's easy to say, oh, this is the bug is causing the problem, we've got to control the bug. But in fact, the, the bug's uh, presence and uh, spread in the landscape is facilitated by climate change. So, you know, climate change in and of itself, it's how climate change interacts with other factors. That's, you know, that's what, what's important when you look at biological systems. It's not the climate change, it's how climate change, in this case, interacts with this uh, pest, and that's where uh, you begin to get uh, major impacts. What's interesting about uh, this story, though, with the adelgid is that that once the hemlocks have, have died, the species that comes in to replace, take over for the hemlocks, is black birch, Betula lenta. Now that's a, a species that, you know, foresters don't, don't like it very much. It's, it's not very good for timber, it's not worth much, but it turns out it's a very adaptable species and nobody would have predicted if you had a model and you said you take the hemlock out and what tree species is going to replace the hemlock, nobody would have predicted it would be black birch. You know, obviously, you know, black birch did not read the books about what it's supposed to do. But if you look in the landscape, and this is really what I'm sort of going to be talking about today is, you know, what is, what is, what do you, when you go out into the landscape, what do you actually see? And this is a, a famous stand in Cornwall, Connecticut, um, that was devastated by a major uh, tornado in the middle of summer in July 89 blew down this magnificent forest of white pine and hemlock. And you go there now, it's, it's about 90% is a pure stand of black birch. So black birch, it's not just random The black birch is the species that comes in after the adelgid. Black birch is a disturbance adapted species and it doesn't really matter what the disturbance is. This is also in that same part of Connecticut, this is a forest of white pine that was logged by the state in 1975 and then they scarified it to try and create a seed bed to get more white pines to germinate and all that came up is more black birch. And so what, what this is telling us is that there's some species that are disturbance adapted. And that's a really important idea. And black birch is the one, is the most significant disturbance adapted species. And so as we try to sort of look at what the forests of the future are gonna look like, species like this that are gonna be able to take advantage of disturbance. And it doesn't matter whether it's logging, tornadoes, or pathogens, the outcome is the same. Black birch is the winter, the winner. So that's a really important idea. And uh, you know, it gives us a big clue as to you know, sort of the things we can expect. I just put this chart in here just so as a review of going back to the days of the gypsy moth of all of the pathogens. And these are just the major pathogens that you know, have impacted uh, our forests and completely altered the comp their composition. So blister rust, weevil, Dutch elm disease, spruce budworm, as you go up into the northern parts of uh, New England, this is a huge problem it's affecting both spruce, spruces and firs, beech bark disease, bronze birch borer is a major problem for our white birches. The M, I mentioned all of these. And then uh, something that's here in the uh, eastern Massachusetts, not so much in the west, is the European winter moth, uh, which is, uh, wreaks havoc on oak trees and has caused a lot of problems with oak on Cape Cod. So this is sort of an overview of some of the pests and pathogens. But for the rest of the talk, what I really want to talk about is urbanization, because urbanization is one of those things that, you know, we think of the city over here and the country over here, but with half of the world's population now living in cities, urbanization is a major, 
force to be reckoned with uh, in ecological as well as social terms. Uh, this is the range map from my book, uh, Wild Urban Plants, and you can see here, this is a definition of urban areas, uh, more than 500 people per square mile. So you can see that a significant portion of the land area fits this technical definition of urbanized land. Uh, and I, I just love this, this picture. Uh, this is Los Angeles. Uh, you know, you can talk about, you know, uh, what used to be native to this area, but the concept that there's some native vegetation that belongs in this area that can be restored, you know, just look for instance here. I, let me call your attention to the Los Angeles River. Uh, you know, a concrete ditch, you know, how do you go about restoring that? You know, so, you know, we have these ideas about, you know, what nature is supposed to be, but when you actually look at, particularly in our urban centers, you know, it's a totally different kind of nature. It's not, you know, it, it's, you know, there's, no, there's nothing to restore here, you know? We can only go forward, we, we can't go backwards. And that's a very important idea. So, and these urban areas are really important. We need to start focusing on them. This is a, a graph showing, this is the urban heat island effect. And it simply refers to the fact that the temperature differential, now this is degree centigrade between an urban area and a more or less adjacent rural area, it measures that difference, and mainly that difference on a warm summer evening. And you can see here along the horizontal axis, this would be the population of the city. And you can see as the population of the city gets, uh, increases, the temperature differential between an urban and a rural area increases. So what's really interesting, and you can see that, you know, up here when you get up to cities of a million, particularly U.S. cities, there's a temperature, temperature differential up to 12 degrees centigrade. That's 21 degrees Fahrenheit. That's huge. And the reason this is important is that, you know, if you're interested in climate change and you want to study climate change, all you have to do is go to the city because the cities have already heated up to the extent that the surrounding countryside is going to be heating up over the next 20 or 30 years. So it's really important to sort of start thinking about this in very concrete terms because cities are really offer us a preview of coming attractions. Uh, now, you can define cities in terms of their population, but you can also define cities from an ecological point of view, the density of the human population is not really all that critical. And this is some work that's done by uh, my colleagues at Boston University. And they ran a transect from downtown Boston all the way out Route 2 to the Harvard Forest. And then every essentially, uh, it wasn't every kilometer, but essentially at random intervals along this transect, they sampled uh, a square kilometer of, air, of area that was adjacent to this uh, transect, and then they measured using GIS technology what was the impervious surface, how much of that land was covered with concrete or asphalt or a building. And what's really interesting here, as you can see here, when you get out to Route 95, okay, it's the ring around Boston, uh, everything within Route 95 has 30% or more impervious surface. Everything west of Route 95 has less than 30% impervious surface. So now we can define urbanization, not in terms of human population, but in terms of the percentage of impervious surface. Because that's what biological systems, that's what really affects biological systems. So when you have more than 30% impervious surface, you effectively have an urbanized condition. So that map I showed you of sort of the urbanized northeast, it's actually about twice that size if you use this definition of what urbanization is. And so urbanization is not something that's happening, you know, off in the distance. It's actually happening all around us. And it's something we really need to think about. Um, you know, uh, cities have very distinct characteristics. I like to think of urbanization as like a, a glacier. Okay, that just rolls along and just pushes everything out of the way. It essentially, uh, you know, wipes everything out and then in its wake it leaves compacted <laughs> glacial till. And, you know, from a vegetation point of view, we're talking about primary succession. There's nothing there to begin with. So everything has to start all over again. And it's a, you know, it's, it's a sobering challenge. Other 
issues that happen in the urban areas, and again, also in non-urban areas, is the application of road salt, which is ubiquitous. Nobody wants to compromise safety for the sake of a few plants. So, you know, everybody is using uh, tremendous amounts of, of road salt. And salt has dramatic impact from an ecological point of view. It increases soil compaction, decreases water availability, interferes with cation exchange, that is to say the ability of plants to take up nutrients, and it elevates soil pH. So, you know, something as simple as spreading a handful of salt you know, on the landscape has profound ecological implications for the vegetation that's growing there. And of course, it's really obvious as you drive along the highways and you see the white pines that are scorched by uh, the rooster tail thrown up by the snow plows as they go along the highway. So salt impacts, there's been a lot of studies showing that, you know, that the salt impacts exist well within, you know, several hundred feet of the highway. And the, the longer an area's been salted, the further out those salt impacts go. So it's not something that's just limited to the immediate edge of the highway. And of course, certain species like this Ailanthus grove uh, along I-95 in Dedham, the reason Ailanthus is such a dominant roadside plant is it's a very, very salt tolerant species. So, you know, again, you could say, oh, I hate Ailanthus, it's an invasive species and so on and so forth. But really, Ailanthus is just responding to the conditions that we've created along these roadside edges. Um, other factors, uh, acid rain is another one. And of course, uh, when you burn a lot of petroleum products uh, that releases nitrous oxide, sulfur uh, dioxide, and then in contact with either ozone or precipitation, uh, it comes down as nitric and sulfuric acid, which totally acidifies the landscape, particularly bodies of water. And so uh, this, again, unlike road salt that elevates the pH, acid precipitation lowers the soil pH, and it puts more nitrogen and sulfur into the soil. So all of a sudden, these nutrients that in most biological systems are limiting are now there in abundance, and that completely alters the uh, dynamic interaction between the microbes, fungi versus bacteria, and then the plants are also part of that. So again, acid precipitation can have profound effects on uh, sub, you know, the, the dynamic biological interactions in the soil. And we did a study, a comparative study uh, at the Harvard Forest and at the uh, Arnold Arboretum. We had a hemlock forest that was heavily infested with adelgid and we essentially cut the trees down in both areas and then looked at, you know, what happens to the soil and the regeneration that follows after that cutting. And what's really remarkable is that in comparison to the, uh, rural Harvard forest soils, the arboretum soils, they were more compacted, they were more acidic, we had a lot of pHs around three, they had a lower uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio, that is to say there was a lot more nitrogen in the, in the arboretum soils than in the Petersham soils, and uh, it was, the plants responded to this in amazing ways, there was a terrific amount more seedling regeneration at the arboretum, and these black birch trees, you know, after six years of growth, were over 30 feet tall. Whereas at the Harvard Forest, they're still poking along, they're about two feet tall. So, you know, contrary to the expectations that somehow, you know, these plants are going to do very poorly in the city, we find that a lot of plants, probably because of the nitrogen levels that seem to be higher from the acid precipitation that's more concentrated in urban areas for a variety of reasons, that vegetation, particularly pioneer species, oftentimes do better uh, in an urban area than they do in the surrounding countryside. Um, another characteristic of urban areas that's very important to keep in mind is what's called fragmentation. And this picture, again, I, I was just in Los Angeles a couple weeks ago, so I took a lot of pictures there. But this is the old, uh, it's called the Arroyo Seco Parkway. And it was built in the 1930s. And you can see here with that tunnel, they actually, this was the, f the first highway they put it in there. It was like a two lane, a four lane road. And they put the tunnel under the hill. So it had no impact on the surface area above it. Then in the 1960s, that wasn't big enough. So they put, they turned this into a one way strip and going, north and then this they built the new highway and that was south going into Los Angeles but when they put that road in they just cut right through the hillside 
So all of a sudden, that's what fragmentation looks like. All of a sudden, you've broken the environment into pieces. And when you do that, you create more edge. And that means when you have more edges, you essentially have more edge effects. So certain types of species, mainly early successional pioneer species, they uh, do best under disturbed edge conditions. They don't do well in the interior of the forest. And the more edges that you create by fragmenting the forest, the more you're favoring the dominance of these early successional species. So I took this uh, picture in uh, flying into Logan Airport, and it's just an adjacent uh, wetland, and then the city of Chelsea there. I, I, it wasn't until I actually put this slide on my computer that I noticed. You see all these little uh, yellow trees in there? This is all Chelsea. Those are all Norway maples. It's, so you can see, you know, how, you know, and you can begin to see the patterns of fragmentation whenever the urban area or a suburban area intersects with a natural area, this edge, these edge effects kick in, and all of a sudden you begin to get a different kind of species at the edge. So wherever you build a road, wherever you build a house, wherever you clear the land, you create edges, and that pushes the successional dynamic in favor of early successional species. And this chart, again, shows you land developed in Massachusetts from 1951, 1971, 1999. So this development is just you know, an, a shorthand for f habitat fragmentation. So this is not something that's just happening in eastern Massachusetts in the, in the Boston metro area. It's happening across the state. And it has profound impact. So, it's very different from the kind of dynamics that David Foster was talking about, which is agricultural disturbance. This is a different kind of disturbance. This is associated with suburbanization and land development. And the way the vegetation responds to that is very different than the way vegetation responds to agriculture. Now, uh, because David Forrest ended his sort of talk in what I consider, you know, uh, the early 1900s, I thought I would sort of carry on uh, you know, the history into the modern era. And of course, this is my reading of history, but you know, from essentially 1900 to 1930, you have automobile replacing horse, profound effect. Trains expand, industrial pollution, forest exploitation. The forests that were abandoned in the 1840s are now available for harvesting. People are cutting it for lumber, for charcoal. Exotic plant introduction from Asia is beginning. Energy from coal. And the big issue that people were concerned about was sanitation and waste disposal. How do we make these cities livable? How do we clean them up? Okay, that was where they were at. Then, from 1930 to 1945, the destruction of the old order, the Great Depression, World War II, another wave of agricultural abandonment, all right? And the, 1930s, the Dust Bowl era, okay? All those people left the Midwest and they went to California. You know, we, we sort of have forgotten about that. And then oil, okay, associated with the automobile, the development of the oil industry. And in this era, the big conservation issue was soil conservation. This is when the Soil Conservation Service, if that was the climate change issue of the era. Anything you can do to prevent soil erosion is a good thing. And this is when most of the species that are now considered invasive in the Northeast, this is when they were planted. And they were planted by the million. And the federal government subsidized the planting of those species. Suburban fragmentation, 1945, I just pulled that number out of a hat, 1990. Uh, suburbanization following uh, war, the end of World War II, chemical agriculture, sprawl mall culture, the expansion of the interstate highway system, plastics were invented after World War II, oil and the gas-driven economy. And of course, the big issue, if you remember Earth Day in the early 70s, environmental pollution. Uh, Rachel Carson, DDT, that was what it was all about. Let's clean up the environment. Uh, and then, of course, in our own era, globalization, the era, I like to call it, 1990 to the present, our post-industrial economies, who knows what they look like. Globalization, sprawl, energy crisis, and of course the big issue, climate change and invasive species. So this is sort of a modern history of looking at, these are social trends that have, had a, that have an impact on 
our surrounding forests. And I have uh, tried to summarize, I apologize, I never do these kind of graphs, but I thought I would try it for this talk. Uh, so if you look at this, so this is the native forest. We're gonna start here. So this is the fate of the native forest. It can go to cities, and if it's a red arrow, that means it's irreversible, okay? They, <laughs> now, it can go, the, city, the cities can, uh, you know, they can revert, but they're not gonna revert to native forests. Now, if you, you know, turn a native forest into agriculture, as we know from uh, the work of the forest, that can revert to a, na uh, a native forest again. Logging, actually forests can recover and revert very easily to a native forest. Agriculture and logging. So yellow arrows mean that essentially you still have a more or less uh, native system here. Now, what's really interesting is that native forests, though, when you turn them into suburbs, that's it. They, they can't return to native forests, but what they can become are what I call novel or emergent ecosystems. Okay, and the definition of emergent, if you can't read it there, the arising of novel and coherent structure, patterns and properties during the process of self-organization in complex systems. So what that means is you have a system and you introduce a new element to it and it completely changes what that system can become. And that's what is happening to our forest. That's why I use the term emergent, is it's a whole new kind of forest that is emerging, you know, in front of our eyes as a result of globalization, the globalization of the economy. And what's really interesting is unlike the forest abandonment story of the 1800s, uh, when you look at land transformation of cities to suburbs, uh, it, it's not going back to native forests. What we're getting is these new emergent forests. So this is a very, uh, from my way of thinking, a very important idea. Some of the players in this new emergent forest, uh, I like to call it actually, uh, to give it a more sexy name, uh, the cosmopolitan urban vegetation. Uh, you know, a lot of people just look at this stuff and they say it's a weed, but you know, a weed is just a value judgment. It's a plant that you don't like. It's competing with something you're trying to grow. So cosmopolitan is my effort to put a, a positive spin on this vegetation. Uh, the poster child, of course, is the ailanthus tree on the left growing on the Great Wall of China outside Beijing, and on the right, uh, the Great Wall uh, of the Arbor Way uh, across the street from the Arnold Arboretum. Now, you could say that this plant is adapted to the urban condition, but the, the, the word I like to use is pre-adapted, and that's very important for understanding uh, urban ecology. Uh, these plants, you know, because cities are not natural or native, uh, plants haven't adapted to them, but certain plants come from habitats that resemble uh, the types of habitats you find in urban environments, so they're pre-adapted. In this case, dry limestone uh, cliffs in Beijing, uh, you know, and what is a decaying brick building in New London, Connecticut, but a limestone cliff, as far as this polonia is concerned. That's, and so the species that grow in our cities come from areas that have habitats that are very similar to what we find in these urban areas. Uh, another important player, of course, the uh, Norway maple. It's, it's one of the great ironies that in the state of Massachusetts as of January 1st, uh, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago, uh, possession with intent to distribute Norway maple was a bigger crime than the possession of marijuana. That was a watershed moment for the state of Massachusetts. Uh, it's now on the banned species list. You can still go to Rhode Island and buy one, but you can't actually sell it in the state of Massachusetts. And it was the replacement for the American elm. It was considered perfect. It's adapted to salt and you know everything like that. But what they didn't realize is that it, it was so well adapted that it, it went wild. And uh, as of 1980, people began noticing that Norway maple uh, was becoming a very important component of many of our urban and suburban forests. And then in the, the quest for always a new and better tree, uh, the calorie pear introduced from China early in the century, but didn't become popular until the 1970s or 80s, uh, was introduced. It was considered to be the perfect tree. And of course, here it is. I like to call this the old field calorie pear. Uh, if you go to the mid-Atlantic region, you see it everywhere. And I guarantee you that within five or 10 years, this species too will be on the Massachusetts banned list. Uh, 
And what's really interesting is that from uh, you know, my perspective, I, I like to tell this story, and somebody's going to get mad at me for saying this, I'm sure, but this is the black locust, Robinia pseudoacacia. This is America's gift to the world. I have, everywhere you go, you go to Asia, you go to Europe, you find this species. It was planted. It was planted extensively because the wood uh, is rot resistant, so it was used for fence posts. It also produces uh, beautiful flowers, so it's a nice ornamental, and those flowers have medicinal uh, uses, particularly in China. But what's interesting here, this is the native range of black locust, okay? This is this best that this man named Albert Little. He did all these incredible maps in the 1970s of the native range of Native American species. Well, you can see here, it gets up into central Pennsylvania. Well, we're here in Massachusetts, and when I was on the Massachusetts State uh, Invasive Species Advisory Committee, the decision was made to put black locust on the invasive species list because it wasn't here, it wasn't in Massachusetts when Columbus landed. So even though settlers immediately started planting this throughout the early 1700s as a long history of being planted, it has naturalized all over the state. Yet, because it wasn't here when Columbus landed, it's an invasive species. Well, this is the quintessential early successional species. The real range of this species is, you know, <laughs> most of the entire continent of North America, a huge portion of the continent of Europe, and a large part of eastern China. You know, so somehow that this should be the frame of reference that we're using to evaluate this species in the modern era seems to me to be somehow missing some critical point uh, in terms of what's actually happening in the world today. And you know, when you, what's interesting about climate change and thinking about it, here's a species, this is the tulip poplar, and I just threw this in here. This is its native range, most of Connecticut, and then up here in this mountain range, the Taconic Mountain Range in New York, and into Worcester County a little bit. So this is one of those species that seems to be uh, increasing with climate change. This is actually becoming a much more abundant species throughout central and western Massachusetts. So, you know, with climate change, it's not just the, you know, the species like Robinia that are increasing, but a lot of our native species are also changing their range. And uh, on the inverse, a lot of our northern species, spruces, firs, and things like uh, the paper birch, which are essentially northern in their distribution, they're actually leaving Massachusetts. So, you know, it's a dynamic. We have tend to think that, you know, these range maps represent some you know, fixed point that we should always be referring to and fail to realize that these are actually just a snapshot. This is where the tree was in 1977. It doesn't represent where it was 100 years earlier and it certainly doesn't represent where that tree is going to be 100 years from now. So these range maps that we see do not, you know, it's, it's not a fixed absolute thing. It's a dynamic thing, but the map makes it look like it's a fixed thing. Uh, another critically important we have to think about forest, it's the shrub layer. And it's my opinion that it's actually the, the most profound impacts uh, on our forest of invasive species is actually happening in the shrub layer rather than the tree layer. And common buckthorn, that's Ramnus cathartica. Here it is in November uh, in Watertown where I live. And it's still, its leaves are bright green. It leaves out very early. It, it stay, it's able to grow for a full six weeks longer than all of the native vegetation because of climate change, because of a number of factors. So these sort of non-native species that do not respond to weather cues, they're no, no good fall color here at all, these are actually have a great advantage uh, in various climate change scenarios. Or glossy buckthorn, this is frangula ulnus, this is very common along edges. These are both sort of edge species. Once they get established in the edge, then they're able to migrate into the heart of the forest or burning bush, which is now banned in Massachusetts, Euonymus alata. This is one of those species, and you see there's a little honeysuckle there. Uh, it's a two for one deal on that one. Um, and this is uh, in Northwest Connecticut. So this is one of those species that's so well adapted. It comes from forested uh, landscapes in Asia, and you bring it into New England, and it's right at home. Um, or honeysuckle, most of you are familiar with the bush honeysuckles. This is most likely uh, Lanicera moroii, but here it is. This is its favorite habitat, and all of the rivers in the Midwest and a lot of the rivers in the Mid-Atlantic region are all lined on both sides of the bank with this shrub honeysuckle. And uh, it's, 
finds these habitats exactly to its liking. Or uh, another band species, Berberus thumbergii, you know, in all of its forms. And here's this advertisement from 1895. I I'm just going to read it because it's interesting. Everybody is now admiring the brilliant autumn coloring of this splendid new Japan shrub. The foliage and the fruits being of an intense scarlet is unrivaled in masses or as a low hedge plant. Now is the time to plant. And you go down the list there, 24 to 30 inches tall, $25 per hundred. Okay, this was, they had thousands of these things. You know, this is how this plant got established. And if you go into the landscape, in a lot of places, this is the way it looks. And you could, you say, oh my God, it's a disaster. But when you actually analyze the past land use pra practice, if you look at the distribution of barberry and you overlay that with what was this land before, was it forested, was it pasture, was it a town? There's some very nice correlations that the areas where barberry dominates, those were all originally pasture. And the way it got established here is the cattle and the horses didn't eat it. And then when it grew up the forest, it was already there in the understory. So it's not as though this plant invaded it, but this is actually a holdover from the era when that land was in pasture. So a lot of these issues are much more complicated uh, than they first appear. Now, you may think that I'm a, you know, that I think all plants are wonderful and, you know, I have no uh, prejudices. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, this, this plant has no redeeming social value. <laughs> it's a, it is, it is, you know, the, and, and in fact, vines are from, you know, are a parasitic life form. They don't invest anything in making a trunk. They just make foliage and they parasitize the forms of, of trees and their goal in life is to knock trees down. That's, and they want to create massive vinescapes, as they're known. Uh, and so if you want to grow trees, you have to actually take a very firm hand. I mean, it looks great on the Thanksgiving dinner table uh, as a centerpiece. But, uh, you know, I, 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 I took this picture myself. I, you know, I have a personal vendetta against this plant. It, and you have to get every single piece of the root out. Every little piece will sprout. So it's not just cutting the stem you actually have to remove the entire root system. This is one of the most tenacious plants there is. But if you want to have trees and you want to have a forest, you have to control it. It's an edge species. It gets established on the edge. Birds bring the seeds in. And then from the edge, it moves in to the forest. So that's the dynamic of a lot of these things. And our own native grapes actually perform in the same way. They're not quite as aggressive as the bittersweet. But one of the, the mechanisms why they cause a lot of problems is when they get up into the canopy, the crown, they, that increases the, the snow load and the ice load on that crown, and it's just the sheer weight of the uh, branches of the vine and the tree laden with ice, it breaks the crown just by sheer weight. So when you have a big ice storm, a tree that's infested with a vine uh, suffers a lot more breakage than one that is not. And Japanese honeysuckle, which has been you know, well known in the South for many years, is now made its way north. And this is now, I'm seeing this everywhere in natural areas throughout, certainly eastern Massachusetts. And at the forest understory, you're all familiar with garlic, mustard, aliaria, petiolata. Um, <laughs> here it is uh, in Connecticut. But what's interesting about this picture is that it looks like it's just all aliaria, the garlic mustard, but in fact, there's a lot of jewelweed in here. The, that's the uh, impatience, capensis. And so that's a native species. They've actually, you know, there's fairly moist soil. So it's not as though, you know, the native species are just being wiped out totally, but they're both essentially, the aliaria is a biennial and the, the impatience. The jewelweed is an annual. So they, they both start over every year from seed, and <clears throat> they pretty much divided up the landscape. And a new uh, one that's just moved into our area, and this is a, a perennial, and it's a, it's a very serious problem, is the Japanese stiltgrass. Again, these are both highly uh, adaptable species, and once they get established, uh, there's no doubt about their spread. And the last one I want to talk about is, of course, Japanese knotweed introduced as an ornamental in the late 1800s. Uh, you recognize it, I'm sure. Notice this little ailanthus poking up uh, in the middle of that patch. Um, but this, I wanted to show you this picture. This is along the uh, White River in Vermont. 
And I was shocked. This is all uh, Japanese uh, bamboo, or I mean, uh, what do they call it? It's the knotweed. Um, this is where, when you go to Asia, this is where you see this plant. This, and so these disturbed river edges, that's its habitat. It's, again, it's an edge species, but these are naturally disturbed edges. And this is up in Vermont. Now, can you imagine after that hurricane we had this summer and all the flooding that happened in Vermont and all these edges that were wiped out, this is clearly, you know, which is, this plant is already well established in there. This is just another opportunity for these plants. So that's what I, disturbance is the driver for, you know, all of these dynamics. And the, the more that the world is disturbed, all of the perturbations I've talked about today, the more these sort of edge species are the winner. So going out on the limb, this is my last uh, slide here. These are future forest trends for New England. So I know I've talked for a long time, so this is it pretty much. Um, the interacting forces of urbanization, climate change, and globalization create novel conditions that favor the spread of opportunistic plants. Water, air, and soil pollution impact soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts vegetation patterns. So everything that's in the air eventually ends up in the soil or the water, and it has a profound impact on the plant life. Habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges, which are aggressively dominated by non-native early successional species. Among the trees, there are some basic trends. Generalist species are favored over specialists. Bottomland species that are used to a high level of disturbance, uh, river bottoms, over upland species, and opportunistic early successional species over stability-loving late successional species. Vines. Uh, everybody's in agreement are becoming much more abundant and creating vinescapes that move into forests from disturbed edges, smothering trees in the process. The shrub layer is becoming increasingly dominated by bird dispersed non-native species that leaf out early and hold their leaves late. The herb layer is uh, becoming increasingly dominated by species that can reproduce aggressively and rapidly exploit soil nutrients. And Lastly, the increasing density of wildlife is selectively favoring the spread of plants with unpalatable foliage and or palatable fruits. And my very last slide, uh, my take home message, uh, that's a whole new kind of ecology, I call it an anthropogenic ecology, is forming before our, our very eyes. And the challenge we face is not how to eliminate these emergent ecosystems. They're, they're really, they're not going anywhere but rather how to manage them to better serve our needs in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.